Um, but I, I, I thank you anyway. Can you hear me all right, and can you see my screen? Yes, so we see the University of Florida, IFAS. And then this is the, uh, the title slide. You see that all right as well? Yes. All right, well then I guess I'll go ahead and uh, get started. Um, again, I'm very pleased to be here, to, pleased to have been asked to present this. Um, I am with the University of Florida, located at the North Florida Research and Education Center outside of, uh, uh, in Quincy, Florida, outside of Tallahassee. And uh, over the years, I've done quite a bit with crepe myrtles, and uh, much of the information that I'll be presenting today actually came from a, a book chapter that I was a co-author on, and I'll refer to that and tell you <clears throat> where you can get it and how you can get it in the near future. <clears throat> so, um, my presentation today I titled Crepe Myrtle Pests, Diseases, and Disorders, and these are actually the uh, pest diseases and disorders except for crepe myrtle bark scale. Uh, Gary, um, right now we see all 24 slides. I think, can you click on the resume uh, slideshow so that we only see the one bit? Yeah. All right. Okay. Yes. Okay. And now? Yes. yes, the spark scale. Yeah, there we go. All right, go so ahead. So I'm not going to be discussing crepe myrtle bark scale today because uh, it's been getting a lot of attention on uh, other webinars and other information. But just as a re review, it does appear the white waxy encrustation found on twigs, stems, and trunks. And will uh, appear white or gray but bleed pink when crushed. So that's the going to be the diagnostic for this particular uh, critter that is becoming uh, an ever larger and ever expanding problem across the South. Um, but today I'm not going to be focusing on this. I'm going to be focusing on some of the other issues. And they are going to be all dealing with what we commonly call crepe myrtle, which is uh, the, the genus Lagerstromia, and specifically Lagerstromia indica, Lagerstromia farii, and the indica times farii hybrids which are most of what are on the, on the market today. Um, there are actually about 50 or 60 other species of Lagerstromia out there that tend to be tropical and tend to be uh, uh, woody. You do occasionally encounter them in uh, uh, subtropical or tropical areas, but for our purposes today, I'm going to be talking about crepe myrtle that has uh, the heritage of indica, farii, and the hybrids today. And this, uh, unless Crepe myrtle bark scale proves us wrong. Crepe myrtle is still one of the most pest-free plants when it's properly selected and placed in the landscape. It really, truly is. The list of problems, of additional problems that it has, is relatively small when we look at other plants such as a rose or hydrangea, for example. Um, and, and I do want to emphasize that there are some basic IPM principles that we need to keep in mind here that um, ensuring a uh, uh, successful planting or, or crop uh, involves proper planning and selection, so if you do this now, you can avoid a lot of problems later, saving energy, effort, water, pesticides, and so on. And ultimately, making the right selections early will make your nursery or landscape easier to manage. And this all goes back to that right plant, right place principle. Uh, when it comes to pests and plants, prevention ultimately is the cheapest, easiest way of avoiding pests. This means buying pest-free plants to begin with, um, selecting plants that are best adapted to your area and to the site that you'll be placing the plants. If possible, selecting pest-resistant species or cultivars. Avoid uh, some notoriously problematic plants. And then properly install and maintain the plants. These are all basic things, but it doesn't hurt to, to uh, remind us of these things uh, when we're talking about any that group. Gary, can That's I interrupt here group. for a second? Just just for a second. Sure. Um, uh, Gary, uh, Dr. Knox talked about, you know, selecting proper plants, and I just want to uh, add here that uh, we had, a, a, it was two weeks ago, we had uh, Dr. Alan Owens giving a webinar on the newest selections that, of crepe myrtles that, you know, that uh, they have at Hammond Research Station, and that was a wonderful webinar that uh, he, uh, you know, we recorded and make it, made it uh, uh, online. Um, and also at SFA, there's a, a crane myrtle uh, trial garden. And of course, uh, Gary Knox himself has a crane myrtle trial garden at Quincy. So these are places, you know, to get information. And, you know, uh, it's nice to visit too. That's all. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Sure, sure. In fact, uh, since you mentioned it uh, already, I was going to bring it up later, but uh, I'm going to mention that crepe myrtles, there are so many new crepe myrtle cultivars that have come on the market that it's very hard to keep, keep up with them all. When I go through my presentation today, I will be able to tell you some of the cultivars that are resistant to a, to a pest or susceptible to a disease. But in many cases, they're all the older cultivars that have been around for 10 or 20 years or so where we've been able to do this research. But the new ones are coming out so fast, it's hard to know how they are going to respond to all these pests and diseases that I'll be mentioning. And it's really, um, I'm really hopeful for the uh, LSU Hammond uh, uh, research site that has the fantastic selection of new crepe myrtle cultivars there that I'm very hopeful that Alan Owings can do a great service to everybody and sort of record the incidents of Cercospora and powdery mildew and flea beetle and so on on all these newer cultivars so that we can get some uh, current updated uh, uh, information on how these, how pests and diseases are going to affect these newer ones. So please, by all means, uh, keep an eye out for, for upcoming research results from, uh, from Alan's collection and Dave Creech's collection and others. Um, so again, just reiterating, crepe myrtle is uh, one of the most pest-free plants when properly placed in the landscape, and that generally means it should be planted in full sun, should avoid wet soils, and avoid planting the, uh, the plant too deep. Um, shady areas, wet soils, and deep planting usually result in problems with crepe myrtle that are expressed in one disorder or disease or pest or another. And so this, again, uh, emphasizes the the importance of uh, proper site selection and uh, proper planting. Um, crepe myrtles, as I said, there are a tremendous number of varieties out there. Fortunately, crepe myrtles are uh, showing some variable uh, resistance to different pests out there. And host plant resistance is a key component of ITM. And uh, we can take advantage of crepe myrtle showing resistance to some of these pests by purposely using the resistant cultivars whenever we can. And in doing so, it may be possible to, to minimize some of our pesticide use by you know, selecting, growing, and using the cultivars that are resistant to the primary pest or disease in your particular area. So this is a, this is a, a lot of great hope, I think, with uh, breeding in terms of breeding for resistance to some of these problems that Craig Myrtle occasionally shows. Um, I am going to talk today about some of the management options uh, for uh, the problems that crepe myrtle has, and uh, really they range everything from the very soft uh, management option like, you know, hand removing an insect from a plant uh, to very hard uh, uh, things that are difficult to do or, or, or fairly toxic, so that there is really going to be quite a range of homeowner-oriented practices all the way to um, danger labeled pesticides that professionals would need to handle in order to, uh, to deal with the, with the situation. When I do talk about pesticides, uh, please <clears throat> make sure that your plant site problem application method and usage is on the label. Gosh, the pesticide labels are changing so often. Uh, new names are coming out all the time. It, it's very difficult to keep up with uh, what's going out there on, on the labels of the different pesticides. So please uh, make sure that the you check the pesticide that you're going to be using for the situation. And then also, uh, I can make mistakes, so please let me know if I need to make some additions, or deletions, or corrections to some of the information that I have. And then ultimately, remember that the label is the law, and that's going to be the, the, the ultimate deter determinant of what can and can't be done. And finally, when possible, I am going to give examples of products that relate to some of the pesticides out there, uh, just to give you a better idea of what some of these are. but Obviously, I'm not you know, necessarily endorsing any of these products or anything either. Um, what I've done for crepe myrtle pests, diseases, and disorders is I've grouped them into what I call major, minor, and rare. And, and uh, that's sort of my, uh, my arbitrary way that I've uh, separated them. And uh, it'll be interesting to get some of your perspectives as to what you might think are major or minors compared to what I think are major or minor. I'm going to uh, start off today talking about some of the major pest diseases and disorders. And these are the ones that I'm currently considering major. Powdery mildew, Japanese beetle, crepe myrtle aphid and sooty mold, cercospora leaf spot, and herbicide injury. 
I want, we're going to start off with uh, powdery mildew, which is caused by a fungus, Arasiphae lagostromiae. Um, powdery mildew is historically probably the major pest to crepe myrtle, but quite frankly, uh, breeding has resulted in uh, resistant cultivars that, uh, such that most plants on the market today are probably going to be resistant or fairly resistant to powdery mildew. Um, nonetheless, uh, powdery mildew, when, it, when there is a susceptible plant there, it would frequently occur in a shady or humid location, and typically during times when nights are cool. And, and when we typically have uh, humid times uh, and cool nights, it's, that's most often in spring and fall, and that's when we generally see the fungus develop on, uh, on leaves of susceptible plants. Um, the fungus can get bad enough to cause leaves, stems, and flowers to, to be distorted. Um, in severe cases, the leaves can drop and flower buds may be so covered with uh, fungal material that they can't open or can't open pro properly. Now, it is a, a rather um, ugly, unattractive disease, but having said that, it really is not a serious problem. It's not going to kill the plant. It just uh, is just as an aesthetic problem that makes the plant look very unattractive. In terms of, uh, uh, of uh, controls, as I said, uh, most cultivars on the market today are going to be resistant to powdery mildew to one extent or another, because most of the cultivars on the market today generally are uh, the result of hybrids of the Lagostromia indica times Lagostromia farii, because it was the Lagostromia farii parent that actually uh, conveyed the resistance to, uh, uh, to powdery mildew among, uh, among the hybrids. And that's uh, all cultivars that are, have this hybrid heritage generally are going to be resistant. The old-fashioned Lagostromia indica cultivars, many of them are still susceptible to powdery mildew, and you do find them um, in uh, you know, just sort of uh, legacy plantings in, in certain situations in the landscape or sometimes um, for historic purposes you might need to use some of the older cultivars or have uh, available some of the older cultivars. And if you do, you'll have to uh, be on the lookout uh, for powdery mildew. Um, so controls for powdery mildew, for one, you can plant the resistant cultivars and species. And for another, you can place the crepe myrtle in a sunny location, full sun location, in an area that allows, allows a lot of air movement to reduce the, uh, the humidity and the, and the uh, chance for the fungus to get established. Um, if fungicides are, are warranted, there are a number that are reportedly effective. Uh, propiconazole, um, sometimes called, uh, for example, Bannermax, thiophanate methyl, Clearys 3336, um, triferine, which is Fundirex, copper-based fungicides, potassium bicarbonate, um, uh, Milstop, for example, all of these are reported to be effective on powdery mildew. Um, and uh, when possible, check with your local county extension for more specific recommendations for your area. Um, I'm over here in Florida, and things can be quite different in Texas. So uh, just, just keep that in mind in general when I go through some of the uh, pesticides and uh, fungicides that I discuss. Um, the uh, next major pest is a Japanese beetle, Papilia japonica. Uh, and this uh, critter is well known to people in the East and the Midwest where it is a, a major problem on many, many plant species there. Um, the Japanese beetle was first uh, uh, discovered in uh, New Jersey in the 1920, and this map here shows how it has progressively moved over about an 80-year period. It has not, uh, uh, generally, it has not moved much beyond what you see here since 2000. But you will notice that there are yellow uh, uh, dots on the map that indicate where pockets of Japanese beetle have become established. And there is such a pocket in Texas and a couple other uh, southern locations that uh, we might need to at least be aware of the possibility for Japanese beetle. Um, it is not a problem in, yet in the West. It is primarily, as I said, in the East and part of the Midwest. We've not seen it much on the Gulf Coast either. It has been found in the Dallas-Fort Worth area and in the Austin areas, um, but I don't know how severe a problem it's considered to be there. So perhaps it's uh, just something to be aware of and be aware of and be aware of, I guess, too. 
In this case, what happens, the beetles will emerge in spring and feed on many, many plants, including crepe myrtle, where they really uh, devastate the aesthetic appeal of crepe myrtle by eating the flowers and skeletonizing the leaves. Uh, they lay eggs in soil, which hatch into grubs, and the grubs themselves can also feed on roots of plants, including crepe myrtle. So it really has a multifaceted uh, means of uh, attacking and, and damaging crepe myrtle. Uh, in terms of controls, you know, in terms of some of the uh, uh, homeowner-oriented type things where, or uh, uh, small infestations can literally be removed by uh, literally tapping branches of, with the beetle over a bucket of soapy water such that they fall in and drown. Um, some things that you will see information about are pheromone traps for Japanese beetle and turf treatments with uh, milky spore disease to control Japanese beetle grubs. But in these cases, uh, from what I understand, they're largely ineffective unless you really do it on a very wide scale, perhaps uh, like a neighborhood-wide scale, in order to, uh, to really get any sort of effective control from these two methods. If you are looking at, uh, at uh, harder pesticides, there is a, a list shown here um, that includes carbaryl, which is, for example, 7, permethrin, neem, um, cyfluthrin, which is tempo, and then there's a new one, um, cyan tranilopril, which is, uh, goes by the name Mainspring. These are some compounds that are reported to control Japanese beetle if you uh, are in that unfortunate situation, which I hope most of you are not. All right, the, uh, probably the biggest uh, region-wide pest of crepe myrtle is the crepe myrtle aphid, Tinocallus kahawalua kalani. And as you see, the aphid is a um, sort of a yellow-green aphid that when they uh, mature into adults, they will form wings and so can fly. Uh, uh, splite is a means of dispersal of, uh, of this aphid. Um, it does overwinter as eggs, and then eventually all adults can form the ability to fly. The, the problem with crepe myrtle aphid is that it can reproduce very rapidly to develop large numbers on new growth and undersides of leaves. And it inserts mouth parts into the tissue to extract plant sap, and that's how it actually does the physical damage to the, uh, to the tissue. Um, and then in extracting the plant sap, generally it has to uh, excrete the excess sap, and that is what we often call honeydew, which will be excreted by the aphids and then drop onto the leaves and stems below and then uh, the honeydew itself can be the source of, uh, of food material for a, for a fungus, footy, uh, sooty mold. So this is the, the situation with the crepe myrtle aphid. Um, it, is, uh, it is a rather uh, interesting pest. The heavy infestations can distort leaves, but it really doesn't happen very often, and it really is not something that's going to kill a crepe myrtle or, or even get close to, uh, to, do, to doing that. And really, it's, uh, it's really more of a minor um, aesthetic distraction. Now, interestingly, this is the only aphid species ever that you will ever find on a crepe myrtle plant. And this aphid species does not get on any other plant. It is host-specific for crepe myrtle only. Now, there is a, an interesting twist. If you would be willing to uh, accept one ugly aphid-infested crepe myrtle in your landscape, you could use it to attract beneficial insects, which then might uh, uh, be able to control other pests that are in the nearby landscape as well. That's something that we uh, have been playing with here in Florida for a while, and we'd like to, to develop that into a, a tool to, uh, to help control other pests in the landscape. Nonetheless, if you do choose to control crepe myrtle aphid, it is, it is relatively easily controlled. Um, we did do some research a number of years ago to look at uh, resist resistance and susceptibility to crepe myrtle aphid. Generally, all cultivars that we evaluated at that time are susceptible to crepe myrtle aphid. Some are less susceptible, and these tend to be your uh, Lagostromia indica cultivars and your dwarf cultivars that appear to be less susceptible to crepe myrtle aphid. Uh, so ones that you see here, like the old-fashioned Near East, uh, is less susceptible. Um, Twilight, the, the purple one, is less susceptible. Um, interestingly, of the hybrids, Natchez, Pecos, and Miami are less susceptible to crepe myrtle aphid. 
However, the flip side of that is that most of the hybrids are very susceptible to crepe merle aphid, um, such as you see here, Biloxi, Zuni, uh, as well as a few others like Acoma, Tonto, Lipan are very susceptible to crepe merle aphid. Not as much distinction between these two groups as we would like, but it does show that there is something going on with the, with the cultivar selection there. Uh, in terms of controls for crepe myrtle aphid, actually um, natural predators can be very effective at reducing numbers of crepe myrtle aphid. Um, ladybird beetles, green lacewings, the pirate bug, the big-eyed bug, surfeit fly larvae are all um, uh, voracious consumers of, uh, of aphids. Unfortunately, you, you usually have to have a large population of aphids in order to attract these beneficial insects in the first place. Because of this, um, you may want to institute some other control methods. Firstly, you can simply wash off aphids from a plant by spraying with a hose. It is remarkably effective to do this if you have a small number of plants that are infested. Um, the other thing is to remember that uh, succulent growth is very attractive to crepe myrtle aphids. So uh, if the plant is a little tougher with a little less irrigation and a little less fertilization, you have less succulent growth, and so the plant would not be as attractive to crepe myrtle aphid. And then finally, if you do choose to use pesticides, they're really very effectively controlled by most horticultural soaps or oils. If you do need something else, you can use uh, pimetrazine, um, Endeavor. You can use the neonicotinoids like Marathon, Merit, Safari, and so on, but of course we're trying to avoid neonicotinoid use today because um, the uh, pesticide shows up in the pollen and uh, can affect the, our pollinators out there. But nonetheless, crepe myrtle aphid um, can be very easily controlled uh, physically or with some very soft pesticides. And again, check with your local extension for, uh, for more, more details on this. Um, crepe myrtle aphid, because of the large numbers that build up and because they excrete honeydew, uh, almost always we find ourselves with uh, an uh, infestation of sooty mold, which is in the genus Capnodium, the fungal genus Capnodium. And sooty mold grows uh, on the honeydew that's deposited on the leaves by the crepe myrtle aphid. And oftentimes it's the presence of the sooty mold that usually clues people in that there is an aphid infestation on the plant. And unfortunately, by the time the sooty mold is there, it's usually a large crepe myrtle aphid infestation. Um, nonetheless, uh, sooty mold does grow as a colony that forms dark patches on the, uh, wherever the, the honeydew has been deposited. And as you can see in the photo there on the left, the, the green leaf is a, is, an un, is a leaf that was not uh, covered with honeydew or sooty mold. And you can see how dramatically different the appearance can be between uh, a sooty mold infected leaf and a non-infected leaf. Now having said this, it really doesn't harm the crepe myrtle. It can uh, basically shade the crepe myrtle leaf, so it might not be getting as much photosynthetic activity because it's, uh, it's preventing light from reaching the leaf. But it does not directly harm crepe myrtle beyond that. Again, this is a situation where we have a, a plant that just looks really ugly because of the, uh, of the, the sooty mold that's present there. Um, uh, you know, occasionally other uh, insects uh, can uh, drop sooty mold as well, but when it comes to crepe myrtle, it's almost always the crepe myrtle aphid that we're talking about, where the crepe myrtle aphid is on, as it's shown in this photo, on the, on the undersides of leaves, and then excreting the, the honeydew on the uh, leaves below that. Uh, in terms of controls, really, if you control the crepe myrtle aphid, you don't have any issues with sooty mold at all. And, uh, Usually, the soaps and oils that you use to control crepe myrtle aphid will also help to actually remove the sooty mold colonies from the leaves. And even if you don't use soaps or oils or anything else, usually time and rain will, uh, will remove the sooty mold from the leaves. Um, you know, but the, the key thing is to make sure you get the uh, crepe myrtle aphids under control. Um, the next uh, major pest is, a, is kind of a new one for my list. It is the Cercospora leaf spot, which is a leaf spot caused by Pseudocercospora lythraciarum. Um, this is one that uh, was first was brought to my attention locally in uh, Florida 
when some landscapers would uh, com complain to me about the crepe myrtle developing fall color during the month of August, where the leaves would develop some fall color and then fall off. And they they were trying to figure out what was happening there. And that's when we realized that it was actually being caused by a leaf spot, uh, a fungal caused leaf spot. And it was uh, inducing some of the, the changes in the leaves. Generally, it occurs during warm, wet weather. Um, and so we really mean it's typically summertime where you have problems with Cercospora leaf spot. It's more of a problem in the humid parts of the Deep South, um, which is uh, obviously along the Gulf Coast. And probably as you move further west in Texas, it would, might be less of a problem. Um, it, it does uh, uh, spots first appear in mid to late summer on mature leaves in the, uh, in the lower part of the plant and in the inner leaves of the plant. And uh, as you can see, the spots will enlarge and eventually the whole leaf will uh, turn yellow and, uh, and fall off. Um, it sometimes starts off very nondescriptly, such that you might not notice it, particularly if it's just a few plants. But as, uh, as the summer wears on, you tend to get more and more of the Cercospora leaf spot, and the spots will enlarge, and the leaves turn yellow and fall off. Again, having said that, it's, it's not going to kill the plant. It's primarily an aesthetic issue, and it's also primarily a landscape problem. It, it uh, doesn't occur in the nursery very often at all. Um, there has been some research done on cultivars that are resistant to Cercospora leaf spot, and there are a number that are, are very good at that, including Fantasy, Tonto, Tuskegee, uh, Appalachie, and Caddo. And on the flip side of this, there are some that are considered very susceptible to Cercospora leaf spot, um, Carolina Beauty, Comanche, Byers Wonderful White, Raspberry Sunday, Acoma, and Near East. Um, and there is the, uh, a reference there that was done, uh, there was some research done at Auburn that reported this, and they would have a more uh, a complete listing of the cultivars that are resistant and susceptible, for example. Um, in terms of uh, controls for Cercospora leaf spot, you can obviously plant resistant cultivars whenever possible. Avoid overhead irrigation to reduce the, the humidity there. You can't do much about the rainfall. And then the other situation would be to uh, use it in a site in the landscape that allows for air movement so that uh, you have less uh, humidity, less of a chance for the uh, fungus to establish. There are a number of fungicides that uh, are effective with Cercospora leaf spot, uh, although I should say the first one, thiophanate methyl uh, clearies 3336, the disease is showing some resistance to this, this particular compound. That's something to just be aware of, but uh, the other uh, pesticides shown there are effective chlorothalonil, sometimes sold as daconil, Tridimophon, probiconazole, and then the uh, strobilurins like uh, Heritage and, uh, and Pageant and so forth. So there are some controls out there for Cercospora leaf spot. Moving down the list, uh, the next problem that I consider major is actually glyphosate injury. This is something that comes to my office way too often for us to, uh, to treat lightly or ignore. Um, it just is a situation that crepe myrtle is, is extremely sensitive to, to glyphosate, more, more so than many other plants. And the leaves are susceptible, but also one has to remember that on crepe myrtle, the, stem, the bark is very, very thin, and so they can get uh, uh, absorbance of uh, a glyphosate through that thin bark. And oftentimes, many new stems are green. And, and again, anything that's green also absorbs glyphosate very effectively. Uh, the, the injury usually results as sort of miniaturized leaves and in sort of witch's brooming of growth. Um, and it doesn't happen right away. Sometimes uh, you don't see that till the following year. Um, sometimes the crepe myrtle will grow out of this, but it's not always, always sure that you can grow out of it in a year or two. Interestingly, there are, are also reports that glyphosate drift may prevent the red color from developing in red flowered cultivars such that you would have a, uh, uh, a pink or white petals that happen to open during the time that they're affected by glyphosate. The petals that open before the glyphosate or long after the glyphosate would be the normal red, but uh, glyphosate itself is reported to affect the color development, which is, uh, which is kind of interesting. 
And as I said, the plants can grow out of glyphosate injury in a year or two, um, but it sure can look pretty ugly uh, in the meantime. Um, moving on to what I call minor uh, pest diseases and disorders. These include bacterial leaf spot, metallic flea beetle, and rabbit tracks. Um, the first of these is bacterial leaf spot, Xanthomonas axonopotus, and this is actually uh, a fairly new problem that developed over the last few years. It was first seen in the nurseries, and it is still primarily a nursery problem associated with overhead irrigation, and particularly there are certain cultivars that seem to be particularly susceptible to the bacterial leaf spot. Uh, and it, it appears as dark brown, angular, irregular, oily looking spots that usually have a, a yellow halo. The leaves will eventually turn red to yellow and drop. Um, the difference between this and the cercospora leaf spot and, uh, and, and normal leaf senescence is that bacterial leaf spot usually occurs early in the year and has circular lesions, whereas cercospora leaf spot and, and normal leaf drop will occur late in the summer or late in the fall. So uh, those, that's one way to, to distinguish uh, the two, two leaf spots. Um, it's often found, again, on lower leaves, uh, nutrient-stressed, and closely spaced plants. Um, for controls, we're talking about avoiding overhead irrigation. Kind of hard to do if, if you have overhead irrigation in the nursery. You can avoid susceptible cultivars, and you can um, uh, look at sanitation in terms of cleaning up the leaves that are infested so that they don't remain to uh, reinfest uh, other leaves. And as I said, Azuni and Arapaho are two of the cultivars that seem to be particularly susceptible to the bacterial leaf spot. In terms of pesticides, there are a few that uh, have been listed here. Um, we have uh, copper products, which would be like Phyton 35 and Coside. Um, we have the uh, Phosphatol AI, which is Aliette, uh, also known as O-ethyl phosphonate. Mancozeb products uh, will all have some efficacy against bacterial leaf spot. I don't think we have a perfect product there for this disease, but it's, uh, it's something that we can, uh, we can work at, at least. The next uh, minor pest is the metallic flea beetle, and uh, depending on what cultivars you're growing, you may not call this minor at all. It might be a major one to you. Um, these are flea beetles in the genus Altica. Uh, there are at least two species that have been identified that cause damage on crepe myrtle. They are a, a small flea beetle that's actually a uh, blue-green color, as you can see here, quite attractive, although it really can do some, some damage to, uh, to plants. It's, uh, it's very interesting in that one can track the progress of flea beetle and uh, probably actually work to, uh, to uh, stop its, its spread and, and, and development, if you could uh, hit one of the weak links in terms of how it develops during the year. What we found in Florida is that it would be initially found in spring on evening primrose, Onothera species, and on curly dock, Rumex species. That's where the metallic flea beetle would first be uh, found or first develop. Then uh, we've seen that move to red-leaf gara, and then to kufia, and then finally to crepe myrtle where it will feed extensively on the leaves of, of all these species. But that's sort of a, uh, a, a process that we've noticed in Florida, particularly since crepe myrtle doesn't leaf out until later. The metallic flea beetle has to get started on other, th other things earlier in the spring. And this would give, an give you an opportunity to maybe try to uh, uh, bring it under control, either by removing these other host plants or by spraying the host plants to uh, kill the flea beetle early on. Um, so this is the damage that it will do to a crepe myrtle. It will chew the leaves uh, pretty extensively, uh, certainly make them uh, unsaleable, if not, uh, if not reduce the, the growth that the plant will experience as well because of the, as a result of the infestation with the flea beetle. <clears throat> In terms of, the, of uh, crepe myrtle cultivar susceptibility, uh, pink velour has been said by many to be the first and worst. Arapaho uh, and Firebird also are preferred, and a few others are listed there, Twilight, Red Rocket, Byers White, Carolina Beauty. And then um, there was, again, some research done in uh, Mississippi in 2004 
that also looked at cultivars, and they have a little bit more extensive listing of resistant cultivars, which include Acoma, Lipan, Muscogee, Natchez, Osage, Tonto, and Tuscarora. And then you can see a much longer list <clears throat> of cultivars susceptible to the flea beetle there. And as I said, we probably don't know about the newer cultivars on the market yet. And hopefully, um, Alan Owings can, can help us in the future. Um, controls, as a, it has primarily been a nursery problem to date. Uh, one could remove the nearby weeds that host the larvae, like the evening primrose and so on, or spray the weeds early on to control the uh, metallic flea beetle. And obviously, you can avoid the more susceptible cultivars in the nursery. And then in terms of um, pesticide sprays or a substrate drench, um, the pesticides that are listed as being somewhat effective are carboreal, which is like seven, your pyrethroids, uh, your chlorpyrifos, which is Dersban, uh, acephate, which has some activity, orthine has some activity, not much. Um, but anyway, these, these are some of the products that uh, could be used. And by all means, um, check with uh, your local extension to see if there's any additional information that uh, we might be able to clear up uh, uh, the, the flea beetle infestation. The uh, last minor problem is one that is called rabbit tracks, and it really is a disorder. It is not caused by any pest or disease. Um, it really uh, it, uh, usually occurs during the second flush of growth in the spring, and what you see are elongated chlorotic spots, usually between the veins on the leaves. Sometimes you have some a uh, little bronzing that takes place as well. Um, it is uh, uh, primarily a problem with your tree-type, fast-growing hybrid cultivars like Natchez and Muscogee. And as I said, it does usually occur the second flush of growth in the spring. Severe cases, you might have leaf margins that become distorted. Um, it's not, we really don't have a definitive cause of rabbit tracks at this point. It's believed to be caused by a nutrient deficiency. Um, and so we really don't have any recommendations at this point. Uh, to me, it's as if the, in the second flush of growth in a nursery, the crepe myrtle is growing faster than the roots can provide some of the micronutrients to the leaves, and hence you get the rabbit track pattern developing. But in any event, crepe myrtle almost always grows out of the symptom by the next flush, so you really, uh, you really don't notice it because uh, the subsequent flushes uh, have normal normal characteristics. So that is rabbit tracks. It is primarily a nursery problem. Very rarely do we find it in the, in the landscape. Now what I consider rare problems with crepe myrtle are edema, Asian ambrosia beetle, and mushroom root rot. Um, edema uh, actually is, is characterized by, by leaf cells that become very engorged and swell up and sometimes get a corky appearance to the, to the leaf. Um, it usually occurs when the plant absorbs water faster than the leaves can transpire it, so that basically the, the leaves and the leaf cells kind of become oversaturated, they become engorged, and they, they swell up, forming spots that uh, may develop into sort of like corky-like spots. Usually this occurs during cool weather and excess moisture as if you have a cool front move in with, with lots and lots of rain that uh, is accompanied with a cool front. There is some cultivar susceptibility that we've noticed, but um, it's really not much to speak about, and, and really this is a, a rare occurrence that's usually caused by weather, and so it's not something that normally we have to worry about and um, can't normally deal with it very, very easily. Um, granulate ambrosia beetle, formerly called the Asian ambrosia beetle, is a, is a serious problem with uh, tree production and weak trees in the landscape in general. It's uh, uh, Xylosandrus crassiusculus, and it, there are small beetles that fly in late winter and early spring. They bore into small caliper twigs, branches, or trunks, and they introduce a fungus, and then they tunnel within the bark of the, uh, of the plant, and the fungus and the tunneling collectively damage or kill a plant. And stressed plants are the ones that are most susceptible, and crepe myrtle is just one of many, many species that are susceptible to this, uh, particularly 
uh, this particular uh, type of ambrosia beetle. And one of the characteristics of this ambrosia beetle is as it tunnels into the, the stems, it will push out the frass sawdust and it will look like a little tube or a little stick or toothpick of uh, a frass. And that's very characteristic of a uh, granulate ambrosia beetle. Um, although uh, uh, irrigation or rainfall can knock off that uh, toothpick of frass and, and uh, you might lose that diagnostic characteristic. Again, the, the key here is uh, stressed plants are the most uh, susceptible. Infected trees, once you have the beetle in them, they can't be treated. You really have to remove and destroy the trees so that you don't um, spread the beetle any further. Um, you can monitor for the beetle. There are trapping systems that uh, you can do some research on and figure out how to uh, put up traps and monitor for the traps. And then there are some trunk sprays of pesticides that have been moderately effective, but that is really something that has to be very closely timed to the first flight of the, of the beetles themselves. And really, the, the answer to preventing or avoiding problems with granulate ambrosia beetle is to keep plants healthy and stress-free. Uh, if you've got plants that are uh, pot-bound and, and diseased and um, uh, not being cared for properly, they're going to be a magnet for uh, the granulate ambrosia beetle. So uh, really do yourself a favor and keep them healthy and stress-free or, or uh, purge them, get rid of them if you uh, can't deal with that. The last uh, rare occurrence on, on crepe myrtle is mushroom root rot or uh, uh, armillaria root rot caused by a fungus, armillaria tibescens. This is primarily a landscape problem and what I'm showing in the photo here is the base of a, of a mature Natchez crepe myrtle where we, we actually documented the mushroom root rot fungus on the roots that eventually also killed the, uh, the bark on the lower part of the stem causing, uh, as you can see, this, uh, this wounding response here. And that was a severe infection and the, the uh, Natchez crepe myrtle eventually died. Um, this is primarily a landscape problem, as you might expect. It causes root decay and will eventually kill a tree. It's often found on sites where oaks formerly grew because oaks are particularly um, uh, susceptible or associated with this particular uh, uh, root rot fungus. And again, the, uh, the only thing that you cannot treat the plant once it becomes infected, uh, and the only way to, to stop the problem is to prevent the mushroom root rot from becoming established by keeping the plants healthy and relatively stress-free. So again, not something that you can really deal with once you have it. You have to try to uh, avoid getting it in the first place. So that was my, uh, my, my categorization of crepe myrtle pest diseases and disorders as grouped by major problems, minor problems, and, and rare or occasional problems. Um, I do have one table to show you that, uh, that uh, shows the life stage activity of primary pests on normal emergent time in uh, USDA plant hardiness zone 8. Uh, and you can see here, for example, the granulate ambrosia beetle in, in zone 8 anywhere from late February to September. The flea beetles will be April to June. Crepe myrtle aphid from April through October, basically any time there's leaves in the plant. And uh, uh, you can also see the most likely times for the uh, three fungi there as well, the, or the, the powdery mildew, cosper leaf spot, and then the bacterial leaf spot. Um, and I, um, just to, to talk a little bit about some of the uh, IPM basics and, and so on, you know, pest-resistant plants are, are a wonderful thing. Unfortunately, we're not in a situation where we don't have one cultivar that's resistant to all pests and all diseases. So uh, the thing to do is if you have the opportunity to select cultivars for your area, uh, decide what is going to be your primary pest or disease issue in your particular area and focus on finding cultivars resistant to that pest or disease. Um, and the other thing to remember is that other factors can make a resistant plant susceptible. And primarily, we're talking about stress. Uh, if a plant is stressed, any resistant plant would be susceptible to a disease or a pest, uh, pest insect. So uh, by all means, 
strive to make, keep your plants healthy. And then finally, you know, if you think about it, you plant enough of anything and wait long enough, sooner or later you're going to find a major pest or disease coming along. And perhaps that's what we're seeing now with, uh, with crepe myrtle bark scale. Uh, certainly crepe myrtles are a dominant plant in, in landscapes today. We need to be aware of all the possible issues that can happen with, with crepe myrtles and try to main, uh, keep them as healthy as we can. Um, and, and again, pest resistant plants are just part of the solution. Uh, you know, design, site selection, planting, maintenance all have uh, enormous impact on pest management in general. Um, and I'll, I'll finish off here by, by acknowledging that I, all the information that I presented today really came from other people that I kind of pulled from. Uh, Matthews Parrott is a uh, plant pathologist here with me in the University of Florida. Most of the information that I presented today came from a book chapter that was co-authored by Matthew Chappell, Gene Woodward, Chris Brayman, and myself. And then in addition, uh, Lee Bloomkamp was, was very helpful with some comments too. And this, this book chapter where that most of the information that I presented today came out of this book chapter. It is an e-book that is available online for free download as a, as a, as a PDF. And um, the book is IPM for Select Deciduous Trees in Southeastern U.S. Nursery Production. And there was one chapter on crepe myrtle, and that included almost all the information I presented today. Some of the other uh, trees that were covered in this book include birch, cherry, dogwood, Chinese elm, magnolia, maple, oak, and redbud. And we also have uh, uh, the same group of folks of which I'm a part also are producing additional books uh, dealing with shrubs as well, where each chapter is on a different shrub species. And you can go to the, the website uh, noted on the slide there and, uh, and certainly get information on this particular book as well as the other things that are coming out. And then, of course, in addition to that, um, all the uh, uh, Southeastern U.S. universities extension have websites on IPM, and I've shown you the uh, websites for IPM Florida and Texas IPM there on that particular slide. Uh, once again, I, I, uh, uh, it was my pleasure to be able to present this information today. I hope it's been helpful to you. Uh, if you have uh, additions, uh, deletions, suggestions, please pass them along. We, I am always trying to, to make this uh, a better, more comprehensive presentation. And uh, I guess I'll end by saying that if we do have time for questions, uh, I'd be happy to an try to answer, answer a few questions. And otherwise, I'll turn it back over to Meng Meng. Well, thank you, uh, Gary. This is just a, just a, great, uh, just a great presentation on, uh, you know, about these pest diseases and uh, disorders on criminal trees. I guess keep in mind is that uh, criminal in general is still a, um, a carefree tree. Um, uh, on the other end, this is the beauty about uh, go to webinars. We have um, uh, Dr. Gary Knox uh, in his office in, in Quincy, Florida. I'm in College Station in Texas, and also I invited a panelist, Dr. Michael Merchant, and he's sitting in his office in Dallas. Uh, so, and then Mike has um, has two comments about uh, the the you know the the two pests that uh, Dr. Knox presented here. Mike, you want to speak up? Yeah. Uh, first, uh, Gary, great job. I, I, I learned a lot of new things from your presentation. Um, just wanted to m make a comment about the Japanese beetle. Unless somebody else uh, has some other information, I have not seen that as being a pest yet in Texas. It is. It does get detected through um, our TDA uh, quarantine inspections and trapping program. But to my knowledge, I don't think anybody's ever found a uh, an infested lawn, or or we I don't I've never gotten a sample from the public in Texas. So thankfully, we still don't have it out here very much. That's really good to hear. Thank you. The other thing I was going to say, if in in the new newer literature anyway, um, the scientific name uh, as they are want to do have changed. Um, with the the uh, crape myrtle aphid, it's now a, in the genus Saru callus. So there's a, there's a slight change. 
change there. But otherwise, uh, uh, I think you were spot on with all the insects. So, thank you, Mike. All right, thank you, Mike. Um, at this time, you know, um, feel free to type in your questions in that little uh, question box, and I wanna, I wanna, I wanna show you guys a little something that. Um, that I uh, observed when I was visiting uh, uh, a uh, parking lot with uh, um, uh, Laura Miller, you know, one of our uh, Ford agents in the Dallas Fort Worth area. <clears throat> um, one thing that uh, uh, Gary mentioned is that you know, um, still you know, good plant selection and, and less stress. So you know, things like this. I don't know whether you can see this, uh, um, you know, this thing that they use to to stable the tree, um, you know, this is not a not a, a good stewardship of uh, our crape myrtle plants. Hopefully, uh, you know, we will see less and less of this kind of thing in the uh, landscapes. You know, in addition to uh, crape myrtle. Um, also, um, uh, one thing that I that we uh, noticed in the parking the reason that we went to see the parking lot was because uh, a lot of trees are dying and different from. Uh, Gary's picture, the uh, root, um, what is that, root rot, the root rot, is that these plants, they're, you know, they're, they start to have these bark, um, you know, uh, damage from, from, from the top, uh, about from the, uh, the, you know, where, where the, these tree crape myrtles start to uh, branch out and, you know, s gradually slow down. And on some of the trees that, you know, the, the bark are almost all gone, and this is a dying tree, you know, when the tree doesn't have the bark system to transport nutrients and stuff like that, you know, it's uh, there. And this is this is the same tree, but this is, you know, at the top, you know, you can see it's the worst. And then, you know, so I would imagine, and at the base, you know, it, it kind of is going down to the base. So as you could uh, see that there's a progression, you know, starting from the top. So that, that's one reason that we think this is probably not the root rod. Um, so this is a situation in the, in the parking lot. There are uh, one, two, oh, uh, one, two, three, uh, three rows of uh, uh, cream myrtles. Um, so this row was the best, you know, performing the best with the least, um, let's call, call it sunburn. Uh, you know, with the least sunburn, this one is the worst sunburn. And this one is where in between. Um, as we notice that, you know, this is okay. This is we're, we. I took this picture uh, here. You know, standing on the south side, uh, looking towards north. So this is south side. So basically, this is a uh, uh, west, and this is east. Um, the difference that we saw of these three rows is, you know, this one. There's no uh, no cars here, and there are cars in these two rows. But um, but. The um, you know these cars are lined up this way versus this is these cars are, are, are straight uh, uh, you know straight angle uh, to the to the to the row. So um, our theory is that we think that's uh, we think that's probably a sunburn, probably sunburn. Because uh, I stand at the uh, at the at the first uh, cray myrtle plant there, and and you could just see the the you know the the, the the, the sun right reflected uh, to where the uh, where the plant is about to uh, branch out, and that's the second uh, car. So you know, as you know, if this is the sunlight, it it goes right reflected to the um, kind of you know into the tree canopy where it uh, uh, branch out. Versus you know, once uh, in the uh, late afternoon, the sun angle uh, goes this way. You know the sun has already uh, weakened itself, so you know the damage was not that much. The other thing made me think about it. It's it's you know it's the sun and, and reflected from the car is that you know here's the shopping center. You know where a lot of the you know the the cars you know the uh, where people will park their car will go into these places. You know you know a lot of people are not going to park here and walk. There these are going to be more uh, park than you know than this area. So that's one thing we observe is that you know more trees damaged in this area than this area. 
so just just a reminder, you know, in the landscape. So we think this sunburn in the landscape that um, the uh, think about, you know, the, the cream myrtle has a relatively thin bark than let's say oaks. So just just another thing that I want to bring to your uh, to your attention. Um, at the end of this webinar, at the end of this webinar, uh, if you if this is a place uh, where you sign up. Uh, greenbeyond.wordpress.com slash webinars. If this is a place where you uh, sign up, uh, you know, you could find the recordings of this webinar and previous webinars uh, here. Uh, there's going to be a, a, um, uh, a, a link uh, right next to the title of uh, today's uh, presentation. So if it doesn't get you there, so if you go here and click on the webinar, you know, it's going to take you to all the list of this and previous uh, recorded webinars. Um, and also there is an uh, email list right here. It's going to give you the instruction to uh, sign up uh, for, uh, to, you know, to, to receive uh, emails for future webinars.